Hello, and welcome back to this three-part interview with Janni Hofmeier about Rosen's relational biology and its application um, to the biochemical cell. Last time, last week, in fact, we talked about Rosen's formalism, relational biology, category, category theory, relational diagrams, and how they represent the four Aristotelian causes and how they interact in complex systems. We defined this notion of Rosenian complexity, which is a, a system with a hierarchical cycle, which is a sort of a, a recursivity, which is dialectic, not just feedback regulation, uh, but, but something different. We're going to talk a bit more about this today and then, then a lot more about it uh, the next time. And since we have all the, the, the theoretical apparatus that we need, I want to first before we get into the discussion, revisit this, this diagram of Rosen's um, that deals with the modeling relation. Here it is, and we'll go full screen on that. And uh, the, oh, that was the wrong full screen mode. Hold on just a second. So basically you can see that there is a, a, a two-way flow in this diagram that goes from encoding a natural system into a formal system, this is what we discussed last time, to decoding the formal system to the natural system, so to see how it corresponds to the, to the natural system. And we, we, we sort of left this out, this is called the actualization problem, because in fact, uh, both Rosen and Louis sort of have very little to say about this. And this is where Yanni's work really comes in. So we're gonna um, mainly talk about this hour about uh, Yanni's attempt to relate these abstract diagrams, relational diagrams, to the actual biochemistry and regulation of the cell. So welcome back, Yanni, to this second part of the interview. And I'm now gonna switch ahead to, to this wonderful slide that you've uh, provided uh, that will give you a, a lot to talk about right at the beginning of the second hour here. So let's bring this up. Okay, Yogi, nice to see you again. Today I'm in a bit, a bit of a different environment um, at home this time. So we may have a dog barking here and there, but you know, just have to forgive that. <laughs> so we're talking today, you'd called it actualization, which is actually also a nice term, but if the realization problem is the, is, is the word that is usually used. How do we go from, from our formal models, which we discussed last time to to the real, the real world. In this case, the real world for me is the cell, the basic unit of life. So here we have a diagram, which strangely enough, I've never seen before. So this is the first time that, that, that in this case, me put it together, showing how one could go from what we talked about last time, which is a hierarchy, a functional hierarchy. So if you just look at a diagram A, function f is actually created by another function g and function g is then created by another function h of course this can go on forever as an in infinite regress and the idea is to to close such a hierarchy in on itself in order to form a system which when we will be called a system which is close to efficient causation which means that f g and h must all be made within the system so basically, every component of the system is in a hierarchical cycle as we defined it last time, right? Yes and no, because sometimes they are all in a hierarchical cycle, and sometimes there is a hierarchical cycle in the cell, or in the, sorry, in the diagram, um, but it doesn't contain all of the mappings. But still, the system is close to efficient causation. So originally, the idea was that everything must be an hierarchical cycle, but it now turns out, and Aloysius Louis, who actually helped me create this by putting some of these diagrams in, in his book, agrees with me that there are systems that, that are close to efficient causation, but not all of the mappings are in a hierarchical cycle. And we'll get in very, see a very nice example of that. My model actually is one of those. But let's look at, at model so all that happens is here is that you start identifying different mappings or different entities in the diagram with each other. So for instance, to go from A to B, you identify 
um, uh, sets C and B, and then you arrive at, at this central model. And the big problem is how do we pull H into the system? So the way that Rosen went about it, and that's the, the, the central column, is he identified D with F, which led to, in the first place, uh, diagram D, and you're pointing to it now. And then he found a mathematical way of pulling H into the system by identifying it with B, with map, with a set B. So, so he was- So, so, so he, just to clarify this for the, the, the viewers, what we're doing here is basically relational origami and, and trying to fold in all the different uh, letters, the components of the system uh, to have them accounted for by other parts of the system, right? I like that. <laughs> I like that origami an analogy very much. So, okay, so that's what Rosen did. He arrived at G, but let me emphasize again, and he, he describes it very nice in his book, Essays on, on Life Itself, which was posthumously published. That it's basic. It's not that he that had a that he had a biological inspiration for this. It was a mathematical way of of folding this in, and he was very happy with that. And as we'll see, the problem is that nobody's ever been able to realize that new mapping, the mapping from, from B that maps F to G. Nobody's been able to realize that in terms of biochemistry. Neither the Rosen himself couldn't do it, and that's the problem with that particular. We're going to get back to this. On the other hand, you can also find different ways of going from diagram D, the middle one, to two other forms where, where everything is included. On the, on the right-hand side, we have E and H. These are two possibilities that are mentioned by Aloysius Louis in his book, that one, and the bottom one, H. Um, but I'm not going to discuss them further. They are also they're interesting mathematically, but they're very difficult. They don't re easily realized in terms of any real system. The system of interest is going from diagram B to diagram C, which in, is the model that we're going to discuss. You can see the difference between this and the other models is that it has two material causes. It has A and D. And I, and I don't fold D into it at all. There's no reason why a system cannot have two material causes. Uh, and we'll see exactly what they are. Interestingly enough, if you can condense C to F by identifying set B with D, and then you arrive at this bottom right hand, which you're pointing to now, which actually occurs in Rosen's book life itself. And it is close to efficient causation. It also contains a hierarchical cycle, a condensed one at that. Um, but he never uses that. And he never actually mentions that it's close to efficient causation. He uses that to demonstrate the system, which is not a mechanism in his sense. So it is a system that doesn't have a largest model. So I'm not going to go into this now, but, but there's an infinite regress. So he, he uses this model for a, for a different purpose. In actual, in actual fact, I mean, it's so closely related to model C that it's, it's, it's a bit of a, for me a little bit ironical that he had, he had all the tools to get to a model that actually works better, but he ch chose to go the, the route to G, to, to his so-called replicative MR system. And maybe we should just put the two of these models together. Right, before model I do this, uh... So this, we have this tree here, and the point, I think, is just to summarize quickly, is that you can derive all kinds of different variants of, of uh, systems that are close to efficient causation, but Rosen chose uh, the, the G, the one in the middle, not because of strictly biological reasons, but um, what are the reasons that he chooses that? Is that, I, I don't remember it making, he making it clear in the book, actually. He does, but he makes it, he makes it clear in various publications. There's actually a publication in 1974 that was part as a chapter of a book um, on biological systems theory. I can't remember exactly what the title, Foundations for Mathematical Biology, I think it's one of those. And there he shows exactly the mathematics behind it. It's a mathematical argument right. of how it's possible to, to, to fold that in um, into this, into the mathematics of the system, into in, with, in, with, in, in terms of category theory. 
So it's so, not a biological argument. No, not a biological one. It's a mathematical. And he was very happy to find such a mathematical uh, way of looking at, at that particular model. But I, it, as I say, in, in, when I'm a little bit unkind, I think of that model as, as a black hole. Once you get sucked, apparently, once you get sucked into that, nobody else sees any of the alternatives. As, as, there's nothing that, that privileges that particular model above all the others that are on, on this particular slide. They're all possible. Um, and in fact, as I say, it's, it's worse than, than, for instance, uh, diagram C. Which right, let's, let's get to that. It's just historically, a lot of Rosen's work has been judged on the fact that this is his model and this is his diagram. Yes. And uh, let's keep that in mind as we go, no, go on with the discussion. But I'll, yeah. I'll bring up the different, the two different alternatives now. Yeah. I think, Yogi, what is important here is that in the first, if you look at the red, at the red arrows, both of them contain exactly the same system. And that is, and it has to be there. It's the metabolism repair system. I'll get to exactly what they mean in terms of biology later. But it's important to note that both of these are metabolism repair systems. There's no question about that. It is how it is close to efficient causation that is the difference. And it is this particular, as I said, the mapping B that maps F into G that is the problem, his so-called replication mapping. So what that we have on has been system. able to show exactly what that means. It's also okay. a very weird term because it's got nothing to do with replication, which usually thinks, you know, you talk about replication as something that like a cell replicates itself. It's right. got nothing to do with that. So, so what we have on the left-hand side is actually a replicative, what Rosen calls a replicative MR system. Yes. And it's important to point out that, that your FA system on the right is also a type of MR system, but a different type of yes. metabolism repair system. Yeah. yeah. So interestingly enough, if you look at the left-hand side, um, there's an, people have looked at this, um, especially the group from, from the Marseille um, uh, Santiago group, yeah? Ethel Cornish Bowden and Juan Carlos Leto here and, and Marilu Cardenas. Um, they chose a different term in the end in, in, because they realized replication mapping wasn't a very nice term. So they chose the term organizational invariance. Mm -hmm. But actually the problem is they also talked about the whole close to efficient causation as organizational invariance. Now you can't use the same term for the whole system and for a particular mapping. So I actually, the organizational invariance is, is quite a nice term and many people are using it. Um, at the moment, and I've got no problem with that. But you cannot also call that particular mapping organizational invariance. So that means nothing then. You know, mapping must point to, to, to some other process in the cell, at least. And organizational I mean, invariance is not a process. The bottom line is that it's really hard to think what that is in the cell, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so on. And what we can now from now I'm going to do is we're going to discuss the right hand system, which I'll show is actually something that can be realized beautifully by what we know about cell biochemistry. So this is the so-called fabrication assembly system that I devised. So what is the crucial difference here? Well, the crucial difference is the way that it, the system is close to efficient causation. The, the other difference is, you see, in Rosen's MR system, B are the products of metabolism. F are the enzymes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And suddenly now the B, which are products of it, fr from which the enzymes are made, suddenly become catalysts themselves. And that is, you know, that's sort of paradoxical. I mean, they are the, they are the, the, the uh, substrates for catalysis. You know, no, no, no they are the, the structural part of, of, of the catalysts, in a sense. And suddenly they become the catalysts themselves that act on catalysts. So, you know, to find that within the cell is impossible. Nothing happens. It's, there's nothing in the cell that actually matches that. So now the problem is, is not mathematical, but the problem is biological. Yes. It's a problem of realization. Yeah, yeah, there's semantics. As I said, there, there's semantics involved. The interesting thing on, on my model 
is yes, we have F and you can see F does two things. It maps A into B and it maps D into G. So, but the functionality is all at the level of F. So we, we'll see, we'll have, to, we'll have to split F into two. One, one, let's call it F11, that does the one function and then F12, that does the other function. And F is a, is a direct sum of the two, of the two types of functions. And so that's perhaps a good, a, a good point to go onto the, onto the next slide where, where we actually discuss the splitting up of F. So you can see at the top exactly what I've said now is that you, you, F is a bifunctional entity and you can split it up into an entity F1 that maps A into B and F2 that maps D into G. But if you do that and you regard this as a mechanism, you also have to split B into B1 and B2. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Because you, B is going to be the product of two different reactions. Yeah. So you, you have you have the left hand, the F1 mapping, and you have the, the F2, the, or the G mapping. So you, you need to split B1. There are actually two ways of doing it. You can split B into B1 and B2, and you can split G into G1 and B2, a G2. But I show in my paper at least that this is the one that we're interested in. So now you have F1, which maps A into B1 and B2, which is a problem mathematically, because you can't have that. Remember the function, the function cannot, on, on the domain side, it must be unique what it does onto the co-domain side. Here, it, F1 does two things, it's not allowed. So you actually have to split F1 <laughs> into two as well. And that's at the bottom. You have to have an F11 that maps A into B1 and an F12 that maps A into B2. And then everything is okay. So as you, can you see now you have um, mappings one and two and three, which sort of fit together. And on the other side, you have a hierarchical cycle consisting of F2 and G. Remember we talked about hierarchical cycles. So it's uh, the, the two functions actually make each other. So that's a cycle that is close to efficient causation by itself. And on the other side, you have a system which is not close to efficient causation yet, but as soon as you merge the two together, the whole system is close to efficient causation because all the efficient causes are made within the system. So now the problem is how do we get around this? Because if you split F1 into F11 and F12, you're going to have to then split B1 again into B11 and B12 as we did in the top, top diagram. And so you see there's an infinite regress in there. I was just going to ask, so it's mappings all the way down here. Yeah, it's map, uh, on, 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 between mappings one and two, it's mappings all the, one, right. all the way down. Yeah. So can so, you so, stop that? Right. So, so, so just to recap that and see if I got it right. So one and two are in principle completely normally mechanistic. You, know, you, you can deal with them just like mechanisms. But if you take these mapping series, then you end up doing uh, an infinite uh, regress here. And, and you need to try and escape that right now yeah. by adding adding more stuff, right? Yeah. So now the trick is to bring formal cause. At the moment, we only have efficient and material cause in here. But if you bring formal cause into it, then you can take F1. You don't have to split it into two. But what you can do is you associate F1 with one formal cause to give you F11. And you, or you associate it with another formal cause to give you F12. So just by bringing formal cause into it, you can actually solve this problem. And so this slide actually shows it very nicely. So what I do in the paper as well, I, I, just to bring things a little bit more to modern reality, I take the, 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 the example of a, of a 3D printer. Because I was always amused by, by this idea from, you know, there's a very famous uh, 3D printer um, in, the, in the sort of op open source domain, which is called RepRap. And that, it was created by two guys in, 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 at the University of Bath. And they had on their website, I don't think they have it anymore. They have this, 
they have this uh, picture where they stand very proudly with a 3D printer on one side and on the other side, a, an identical 3D printer. And the claim was, well, you can use the, the, the one 3D printer to print all the parts of the other 3D printer. And so there it stands and, this, and the 3D printer has replicated itself, is the claim. That's that's what you call fabrication in your model, right? That the yeah, 3D so. printer is able to print all its parts, but... But there must be some, something or somebody that assembles the part into the 3D printer. So this is also a bit of a problem with... And, 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 and here I bring von Neumann's self-reproducing automata and, and, or, 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 automata and his idea of a universal constructor also comes into this. So in, in fact, what I, when I brought von Neumann and the 3D printer together, I realized that the, the trick in here is to think of what I call manufacture as two processes. And von Neumann just thinks about it as one process. And, and, and the guys at Bath also just thought of it as well as, you know, that the replication process is, is just a, a one process. It isn't. And we know in manufacture that there are two processes. First, you have to take raw materials. Let's take an example here. Raw materials X, if you look at the top uh, left hand A. So there's X, that's the raw materials. And what you have to do is you have to convert those raw materials into the parts, set of parts from which some or other um, uh, composite automaton is made. Composite automaton in this case is F2. So B2 are the parts from which it is made. And in order to make those parts, you need information. And that is the I2. So I2 is the information that is needed to build from X, to transform X into the set of parts, B2, from which F2 will be assembled by G. So G is an assembler and so, F1... So, so. Yeah, so F1 plus its information together, they're the fabricators, mm -hmm. and then G is an assembler. So a manufacturing process also in our real world is always split into a fabrication part and an assembly part. I, in my previous publications, I talked about self-fabrication, but I realized I have to talk about self-manufacture yeah. if, yeah. if I have to be you know, precise about the process. So here so, I break so, it so up. If we can think about this as a IKEA, you know, you go to uh, the, the furniture store and you have a list of parts, which is I2, and somebody in the factory made those parts, which is F1. No, 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 no. Or not. What do, you mean by a list? what do you mean by a list of parts? Description so, of parts. Yes, so the, the description, this IKEA manual that you get with your furniture is I2. And somebody, F, F1 is the, the factory worker who made the parts, right? And then there's a no. second step. No? Nope. Okay. Nope. Tell me where I go wrong here. Right. So I so remember that the set of parts that you buy in IKEA yeah. is B2, right? Not X. Yeah. It's B2. Ah, yes, yes. Okay. Right. X is the raw and materials. You are you them. are at home, you the, you are G. You That's what there. I wanted to say. Okay, so that I got right. Right. So G actually, in this case, would also need a set of instructions. How to assemble your yeah. So I2 is actually the manufacturer of the set of parts. And for that also there's information needed. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so, but I've, I, I, I'm ambiguous in this diagram, ambiguous about what G actually is. It's an assembler, but I don't say, is it an, maybe you can think about G that has memorized the instructions for how to assemble F2. Then you don't okay. get it. Very good. But at this stage, I2 is actually how to make the set of parts, the descriptions of the right. set of parts. So that is, in fact, a, that is a von Neumann constructor. It's not universal yet, right? But it is the constructor. It's just I've broken it, the construction part, into fabrication and assembly. So, so the, the constructor, the whole diagram represents is the, the constructor. constructor. Yeah. yeah. However, it could be that I1, and if you look at, at, at diagram B, the I1 could be the description for how to make the set of parts for the constructor F1 itself, right? And if that is so, and you can think of 
of A and B together, it would be a universal constructor in the sense that given the information for its own parts, the constructor can be assembled. Still, we are unambiguous about the left-hand side, but not about the right-hand side in the sense of F is explained, but not G, right? Right. So what I've done now in this, in the, in the diagram, which says A plus B, I've put those two together. And that is basically an, 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 an expression of a sort of, of von Neumann constructor, but G is not made. G sits outside the system still. The assembly sits outside the system. So the so is assembly- the, Is the, the rep-rap here in this, is that the rep-rap? Yes. Yeah. That's the rep-rap. Can make any set of components and it can make its own set of components, which of course is not true in the real world. There's no way a 3D printer can print all of its components. Right. It can print yeah. many of yes. them, but not all of them. Not yeah. yet, at least. But yes, so it's rep rep and, 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 and G are the two guys standing there very proudly looking and forgetting that they are actually the guys that assembled from the set of parts <laughs> a copy of rep rep, right? I find it a very nice analogy and makes things clear for me. It's great. And all that I've done now in diagram C is say, okay, but I can add any set of information, any new set of informational descriptions, for instance, to make an automaton F3. And that could actually be something that maps A into X. I can now start postulating any new automaton by just giving it a new set of, uh, of descriptions for its parts and the assembler just sticks them all together. So that's the one thing that I've done. So I've now actually created a, a mapping that says where X comes from. I could add more and more and more and more to them until I've got a whole, let's call it a metabolism on the left-hand side. And what I've done on the other side is to say, well, F2 could actually be an automaton that creates the assembler, right? So it maps D, some external source into the assembler G. So that's the manufacturer of the assembler or the fabrication, whatever you want to call it, of the assembler. And there now suddenly, if I compose all of those mappings, that's the term that is used in category theory, I can do them, compose them and into one mapping. This is this mapping at the top here in D, just that that mapping, the whole thing, that, that whole thing is one mapping. And there's a little, the the circle is, is the composition that is, operator. That is the composition operator, yeah. And what you, what you have there, can you see, is basically a more elaborated form of the, of the FA, manufactured system that either fabrication assembly system that I had before. That so one it's, on the, on it's the basically right. this. Yeah, it's this basically type. that one, yeah. And now you have explained very nicely what the fabrication and assembly parts of that are. Yeah. And how formal cores, in my case here, information, description, whatever, fit into the system and stops the infinite regress. There's no infinite regress in the system anymore, except there is still an infinite regress inside that cycle on the, the impredicative cycle on the... Here. Not that one, that one, yeah. Yeah. But that's a hierarchical that's, cycle. That's, that's a hierarchical cycle. And that's what gives you the, the impredictivity in the system. But the left-hand mapping, the, the blue-green mapping, that is a mechanism. So maybe summarized here, right? So you have two parts of this diagram. The left-hand part is well-behaved, mechanistic. Um, well, we'll come back to that. We, no, it's saying, mechanistic. Yeah. But but G is G is a bit troublesome. But but overall it's 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 uh, just that's the mechanistic part of, of a cell. And then on the right hand side is the hierarchical cycle that makes the yeah. system. Yes. So we know what F F1 is. F1 is all the catalytic machinery inside the cell. We're talking about enzymes, we're talking about well, F1 or F2 or F3, whatever. They're all on the same level, they're all catalysts. The question is what is G in the cell? What is the identity of G? What is, you know, how do we realize G inside the cell? And that's going to be the trick that we're going to come to next. Right. Okay. So before we go there, uh, so, so we're going to have some, some very detailed argument about um, 
you're going to walk us through the biochemical view and how, how this maps on this. But we also wanted to, to very briefly point out um, this sort of dynamical aspect of, of, of this. We, we're going to come back to that later, right? So, so yeah. what's happening here, uh, we have to stress, I think it's very important to stress that these diagrams that we're showing here, and we've said it before, are not some sort of network diagram, classical regulatory network diagram in systems biology, or they don't point to a necessarily fixed physical structure. They can, some parts of it can be implemented by fixed physical structures, but these are complex relations, mappings between very sort of maybe even quite abstract parts of the, the cell. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to that. It's just important to point out. And what's also important to point out is that there is a, is, is a sort of a big, um, aspect to this, this realization problem that is not just uh, thermodynamic but kinetic, right? Because it's about enzymatic catalysis. Maybe you could say two or three words about that before we go on. So we're going to, as you said, we're going to talk about this in detail because it's very important. But we have to realize here that, that the system, in order to function in the real world, has to be thermodynamically open. And you can see it is. So A and D are external inputs uh, which allow the system to be thermodynamically open which allows it to be a dissipative structure etc by, thermo, by thermodynamically open you mean it's both materially open i mean the a and d come provide material inputs and in order, yes, in order to be thermodynamically open you have to be materially open yeah if you have a system what thermodynamically open means that you have something coming in from the outside across the boundary into the system and out again. So, so you have a flow. It could be a steady state that is established, but if it was closed, it, the, the, the final uh, state would always be chemical equilibrium, death. And if you have a thermodynamically open system, then you operate far from equilibrium. You have a state far from equilibrium, maybe a steady state or, the, or a shifting steady state or whatever. Um, but the system can function in terms of energy flow. Right. And that's A and D. However, these reactions, we must always think of them as embedded in a whole sea of possible reactions, right? And in order for this particular functional organization to, uh, to, to be an entity on its own, it has to be lifted out onto a higher level of time hierarchy. So it has to be faster than, or uh, orders of magnitude faster, in fact, than what happens on this basal level of mass action reactions that happen all the time, but very slowly. So I love this metaphor of lifting out. So you can imagine this whole background of possibilities, possible reactions, and then what's actually implemented, what's realized, are those that, that come first, that go faster than others, and that's where yeah. enzymatic catalysis yeah. comes in. So if biochemists know very well this Boehringer wall chart that you see of all the hundreds of reactions in a cell. In fact, that whole network, think of it as Im embedded in a whole sea of possible reactions, and that whole network is lifted out onto a higher time scale, a faster time scale, by specific enzymes. Now, each particular reaction catalyzed by a very specific enzyme. It's not general catalysis, it's specific catalysis. And we're gonna come back to that as well, because that's extremely important. Just to stress that again, that requires the system to be thermodynamically open and far from equilibrium. So when we say a system, it has some sort of constraint closure or closure to efficient causation, it always implies at the same time that the system is open in those other regards. And it's also open, as you pointed out, uh, uh, implicitly earlier to information. Could you say a bit more about that? Yeah. So, and you see there, it's A and D is the material causes of the cell that allows it to be thermodynamically open. But I is also, in this case, a given. It's not produced in the cell at all. So this is also something that has to be given to the cell. It must exist in the cell. I call it a freestanding formal cause, right? Um, we discussed that in the previous lecture, the difference between a freestanding and an incorporated formal cause. And so this makes it informationally open because I can change yeah, through mutation or whatever. Or you know, in this case, I can, if I, you know, if a, a, a sort of manufacturing system, I can give it different I's in order to make different F's. Yeah? 
So I can change, so that allows the system to adapt and evolve, to give us the possibility to adapt and evolve. So it's informationally open as well. So it's that allows form. evolution, basically. Yeah, exactly. It allows adaptation and it allows evolution because you can have it, you can have a whole set of eyes and only a few of them are expressed, like in most cells. And not the whole whole of the DNA is expressed, or the whole of the the, the possible functionality is expressed. It's always a subset of that. But as the conditions of the cell changes, it can adapt. It can start using another part, another subset of the of I, in order to you know to adapt to a, a catalytic machinery that can handle the new the new challenges. Mm -hmm. so for instance, taking an, a, a, taking an E. coli cell and put, you know going from glucose to lactose as a as a, 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 a nutrient, and the cell adapts by making more enzymes, beta galactosidase and the permease and whatever. There's a famous lac operon that that uh, Monod and Jacob, uh, you know, discovered and discussed. So this incorporates adaptation at both physiological and evolutionary scale. That's very important. So it's very broad, right? I mean, that's yeah. it's not just evolutionary adaptation that is covered here, but also what you could call regulation. That, and let's face it, if you want to have a model of the cell and it cannot evolve and it, you know, it, 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 it's thermodynamically closed, your model is useless. <laughs> it has to have those two properties. It must be open to, to you know, thermodynamically open and it must be open to formal cause as well, to information. So basically, just to, to, to summarize all of this, this is a, a, a cell that is capable of adaptation, physiological and evolutionary, uh, all in these few um, uh, arrows and, that, and, and components down here. So that, that what, what we've done here is we've abstracted um, the organization of a cell to a very high degree, and we've packed a lot of complexity into each one of those components yeah. and arrows. And I think what you're gonna do next uh, is, is walk us a little bit through how uh, that maps onto the actual processes of the cell, is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is the, from, a, if I was a true relational biologist, then I would say, well, I have constructed this particular model, you know, just thinking about the mathematics and how things fit together. And now I am seeking a realization of this model. I'm going to see, does it map onto anything that I know? Of course, this is not the way science works. Uh, I'm a biochemist. So I started with the biochemistry tried to figure out what happens there, then started with modeling, seeing, ah, this doesn't work, go back to the biochemistry. So you go to and fro and to and fro until you have, there's a, your, your modeling relationship must commute is the term that is used. When you have right. these two, you know, separate views of things, the modeling view and the realization view, and actually the mirrors of each other, call it a functorial relationship between the two. So if that diagram that form that that diagram that Rosen made of the modeling relation, if that commutes, then it works. And I'll show how to make to commute. That's so now we're gonna so get in. I'm disappointed to hear you're not a true relational biologist, but what you're saying <laughs> is that it's not in principle, it would be this modeling relation would be an iterative sort of going through the cycle. Uh, but it's not the, the real world is messier than that, and you didn't really do that. You came from all kinds of direction, and exactly the, the, the commuting uh, happened in the end. Uh, well, the commuting is what you strive for. Yes, exactly. And but what I not claim in, not in any of... sort of simple or straightforward way. I mean, there were lots of um, uh, uh, side tracks and, and and obstacles on the way. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that's uh, so. I'm happy to to be able to report now that I think I can convince you that I have a, a commuting model. So let's go to to now. We get into where I feel very comfortable. <laughs> so as I said, I'm a biochemist, and as a biochemist, again, the snag is. I mean, you look at that Beringer chart. It's a hugely complicated chart. In in this particular model that I show you here of the cell, it's a very small part. It's the, basically the blue, the, the blue arrows. That's the whole of that huge Beringer chart. So you can actually condense it into one big arrow if you want to, but I had to split it up into the different building blocks. So that's what intermediate metabolism is for. It makes the basic building blocks for biopolymers, for complex proteins for 
nucleic acids and for complex lipids. And for that, of course, you need the various building blocks, amino acids, nucleotides, and fatty acids. And so that, those are the three, the three arrows that we see, the blue arrows. They lead to amino acids, they lead to lipids, and they lead to nucleotides. From the nucleotides, you have, of course, all the polynucleotides that are made, DNA, the RNA, mRNA. Just to clarify, from lipids, using, you have a membrane. You're using the same notation, right? You're using material flow, uh, causes are, are solid and, and uh, yes. efficient causes are, are, are yes. dashed yeah. here. Yeah. For the moment, I'm not talking about the dashed arrow. I'm just talking about the material. Yeah. Okay. What I would call, and, and this is going to be important, this is all, all, all of the material, the, the solid arrows here, are all covalent reactions. So this is covalent chemistry happening, you know, bonds that are being made and broken, molecules that are transformed into each other by covalent chemistry. So this is all perfectly structural. And all the, uh, all the products are all just molecules. They're not functional yet, right? Okay, so blue arrows, basically intermediate metabolism. Then amino acids are are made into, uh, uh, into amino acid tRNA, the genetic code that's involved there because that mapping is very important. So that is the, the, the sort of coding mapping inside the cell. Um, that's of course the, the amino acid tRNA synthetases. They do that specific coupling of a tRNA to its, to its amino acid. And of course, then the codon, anticodon uh, works there. So in fact, the, the the genetic code is instantiated in amino acyl TNI synthesizers. Those synthetizers actually contain the information about how to, you know, how to make the genetic code. Of course, the, the, the amino acyl tRNAs are the adapters then that, that, are, that, that, that communicate between messenger RNA, which I've shown here by that little dotted arrow here, yeah, and uh, polypeptides, where the ribosomes come in. So that's a formal cause here, the dotted line, right? Yes, the, all the red stuff is formal cause. The green stuff is polymer synthesis, in this case, the uh, synthesis of polypeptides. And note that the polypeptides themselves are inactive. They're just structural. They're just sequences of amino acids. Before they can come, become enzymes and functional, or before ribosomes can become functional by actually combining ribosomal RNA yeah, and ribosomal proteins, they have to fold and assemble. So the, the, the orange arrows are, are the, assem the assembly part. So everything else is, is fabrication. Remember my fabrication assembly system? So the blue and the purple and the red, that fits into that into the fabrication system and the, and the green. The green is in the end, the making of the polypeptides. So the polypeptides are the, the, the building the sets of parts in yep. the end that have to become functional. And now the trick is how do they become functional? What is the G? Remember in my model, the assembler. Uh, my realization was that the assembler actually is the intracellular milieu because for folding, and correct self-assembly to take place, it has to be done in a very particular environment. It has to have the right pH, the right ionic strength, uh, something like uh, macromolecular crowding plays, you know, plays a part. So the composition of the intracellular milieu is a chemical environment that has to be maintained within very strict limits, it must be homeostatically maintained. If you change it, it will change the function, functionality of the cell. So in a sense, it's not a catalyst, it's not a chemical catalyst in the sense of an enzyme, but it has catalytic function in the sense that it makes a process happen without changing itself. All right, and so it's, it's, it's in a very sense, it's a general catalyst. So without it, you, you don't get the right folding, you don't get function. And what's very important is it's not localizable. It's a systems level property of the cell. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not something you can isolate. Right. Like an enzyme. Right. Like an enzyme. Yeah. Obviously, if you That's break the cell apart, you lose it. Or exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. And it's even so more complicated because chaperones as enzymes are involved in maintaining it as well. And of course, electrolyte transporters are very important. Yeah, the chaperones, of course, have become a part. Of, uh, uh, that's why I put them in. They've in, in modern cells, they play an important part in terms of uh, causing um, sometimes correct folding, but basically, you know, avoiding misfolding. So they are micro environments as part of the intercellular milieu that that allow uh, assembly and, and, and folding to, to occur correctly. Chaperones themselves, of course, the question is where do they come from? They're, they're also made as polypeptides and they probably self-assemble and, and self-fold or they may even cross chaperone each other. We don't quite know, but I mean, if we take for granted that chaperones don't need, it's not, that's not something from the outside that needs to fold the chaperone, they can do it by themselves. Yeah. So yeah. That, is, that is something that we can, Except now, so the so intracellular milieu is then a very important component. What it is, is the catalyst of non covalent chemistry, of supramolecular chemistry. Because folding and assembly, there's no covalent um, breaking, covalent bond breaking or synthesis. It's purely a conformational change that is happening. So it's all, so it's basically supramolecular chemistry. Intracellular milieu is the catalyst. Whereas for the other, the, the Enzymes are the catalysts. And it's often just taken for granted, right? I mean, we, we don't realize that to get the right sort of functional folding, you need to be in a very specific milieu. Yeah. Well, of course, I make a point in the paper later on. I mean, this is what is beautiful for me about the lessons that we learned from the cell is that this scales up to all our organizations. If you think of a society, what makes society functional? It's a maintenance, you know, you know, a careful maintenance of its culture. What makes an organization, you know, business organization functional? It's its internal culture, which allow mm -hmm. its agents to be functional. If it's toxic culture, it can't work. So, or, then, or models of the economy that, uh, you know, the behavior that, of each agent in an economy um, crucially depends on the, the state of the macro economy right now. Exactly, exactly. So this is a, you know, this is, it's not a, it's just that no, I'm surprised that I, I'm apparently the person that has, has realized this. I mean, I, I, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. But now the problem is, it's not close to efficient causation yet, because the intercellular milieu is a, is a thing that has to be maintained. And especially it's electrolyte composition. That is the most crucial part of the intercellular milieu. And we know that the intercellular milieu's electrolyte composition is quite radically different from what happens outside, especially with regard to uh, ions like potassium and, and, uh, so, and sodium and, those are, and, and chloride. Huge differences. And, and I, there's a paper of mine in, in the handbook of biological anticipation, a handbook of anticipation, where I wrote about basic biological anticipation, where I discussed this, and I also give a table with all the, you know, the differences in the electrolyte compositions. So that will be posted in the links below. Yeah. And so the electrolyte transporters, which have already been made, yeah? so that's part, electrolyte transporters are just like, like enzymes. They are polypeptides that fold, in this case, in the membrane environment into something which is fun functional. So you don't have to explain where they come from. They're already there. But they are the ones that, that very strictly maintain the, the electrolyte composition of, of the cell, the intra, intracellular elect, electrolyte composition. So that's where the closure now takes place. Right, right, yeah. So we've got three sets of efficient causes here. We've got the efficient causes for covalent chemistry, we have the efficient causes, the intracellular milieu for non-covalent supramolecular chemistry. And we have this efficient causes that maintain the intracellular milieu. That's it. Three parts, so, should I switch to the next slide then? Yeah, remember these, the, the color coding, I keep the color coding. So there now we, this is now the same that we've now just seen, but now I've cast it into a formal, a formal relational biology model. So just to recap at the top, we have the top left. That's my little model, the, 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 the simplest one. Numbering the, the three sets of efficient causes, 
again using the same you know the color scheme that i had before so this is metabolism and protein synthesis to give us polypeptides here b are polypeptides then you have the intracellular milieu the, 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 the uh, orange arrow that gives you the functional going from non-functional to functional f and then f of course can be split into two on the one hand it also it catalyzes the non-covalent chemistry uh, the covalent chemistry and on the other hand it maintains the intracellular milieu through electrolyte transport and then at the top left, uh, sorry, the top right, is just an elaboration of that model that we've seen before. And at the bottom is now the full model containing all the different entities that I had in my biochemical explanation before. It's just how they relate together formally now and how you can do the constructor mappings with, with direct sums and with uh, Cartesian products. But again, I've, I've, I've blocked them, you can see one, on, the, on the, the blue or sounds looks a bit grayish now. Um, that is the, the covalent chemistry part. Two is the intracellular milieu part. And three is the electrolyte transport part. So this is just an elaboration showing what happens inside the cell and how it relates to the very simple model at the top left. So what we would like the viewers to do is to sort of squint a little at this slide and then you can see how the abstractions the different levels of abstraction at the top sort of immediately precipitate from this uh, more realistic and detailed uh, model of the cell below. Yeah. So this, of course, there's a lot of extra chemistry that happens inside the cell. I mean, so so for, but this is the core, and you don't need to ex to explain this the extra stuff inside the cell. You don't need anything more, functionally more. You just have to add more enzymes or you know, compartments or whatever. But in principle, this is the manufacturing core of the cell from which everything else follows. That's what you are calling self-manufacture, um, which consists of fabrication and assembly. Assembly. Before, yeah. yeah. So just now we'll see nicely what the fabrication assembly is actually the same as metabolism and repair. So, so just here, even there is embedded inside this previous diagram, there is this very simple picture of, a manu of the manufacturing core of the cell. So I, the red, that's the formal course, the informational part. C is the coding part, the genetic code, which mediates between information and, and polypeptides in the end, yeah. R, the ribosomes, actually the, the fabricator, but the fabricator is not the ribosome on its own because it can't do anything on its own. It has to have information. So it combines, as you can see there, it's a Cartesian product between mRNA and the ribosome at the top. A little bit up there, yeah, yeah, that bit. So that's the fabricator. And then the intracellular milieu is the assembler. That little M at the, the lower right side, it's very yeah, important. I'm yeah, that little M. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here, just to summarize, so you have, as you would expect, informational apparatus is code, uh, biology is mediated by DNA and mRNA. It was very interesting to, to just point out again that the genetic code is actually uh, just an abstraction of the process of, of uh, amino acyl tRNA synthesis processes in the cell. And yeah. uh, then the ribosomal uh, uh, you know, uh, production of polypeptides and the folding of the, the um, uh, the, the proteins are two very important, two very distinguishable, or, you know, we, ha we have to distinguish those, those aspects yeah. of, of, yeah. of the uh, self-manufacture, as you call it, right? So there's, a, yeah, right, right. So, so an important point to make here mm -hmm. is look at the ribosome. So a, a universal constructor, the constructor can make itself. That's the idea for Neumann's idea. But note here, the ribosome cannot make itself. Because there, there have been papers that, you know, that sort of make a direct translation from von Neumann to the cell and say the ribosome is the universal constructor. It's not. It cannot make itself. It can only make its own polypeptide components. But it cannot make its catalytic part, which is the, the, the ribosomal RNA. That is made by, an, you know, by a 
uh, polymerase that is in the end made by the ribosome, but ribosomes cannot, I think the important point, they cannot make themselves. They can only This make is extremely, yeah. so extremely important because the, the, uh, the M is a, is a systems level property of the cell. So the, the, the constructor is the cell. And an analogous uh, uh, argument has been made for replicators and reproducers. So by James Grissomer, who says replicators, naked replicators are not replicating themselves uh, only a cell cycle is replicating them as part of it. And, and so you can make this argument both at the, the level of protein synthesis and at the level of, of DNA synthesis. And that's very important. So the, the, the universal constructor here is the cell, right? Yes, yep. yes. exactly, exactly. So I think that's a very important point that, that yep. should be stressed. Yeah. DNA, of course, cannot do anything. DNA is the... As many people off now, but the DNA is the most boring, <laughs> most boring and uh, molecule in the cell. I call it the anointed slave. It's looked after. I mean, we also know now it's, it's, you know, it's not a very stable molecule. It has many errors all the time. It has to have to be corrected. So it's the anointed slave. It's not top of the hierarchy. It's really, in a sense, bottom of the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very so important, obviously. <laughs> It's beautiful because James Grissom in his paper has a very similar sentence where he says it's not the ruler, it's somewhere in, in, in the deepest, uh, at the deepest level of a, a hierarchy of prisons. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Right, right, right. I like that. If we upset people, maybe that makes them uh, think about this, which is, is would be very important. Great, thank you. I mean, that's, that's, that's really, really important for all of biology, what we're, we got to right here. Right. So to 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 stress that again, um, you've beautifully dissected these different components. So that the, the nice thing is your model is both uh, a, a systemic level because it requires at least one systems level variable, but it also is an analytical model of the cell where you can um, distinguish different aspects of this process that you cannot obviously take apart without losing the essential. Um, uh, sort of aspects of a living cell, but you can distinguish their functional contributions. And yeah. uh, this beautifully summarized in this, in this abstract diagram that is not, again, not Rosen's diagram, but a related one that has the same sort of abstract properties of, of closure, especially of closure to efficient causation. Yeah. yeah so here, the, 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 close, the closure map is the electrolyte um, transfer, you know, that blue, the blue, uh, the, the, the light blue part that I had in there. It's not in, in here, it's in the previous, there, yeah, yeah. Uh, three. That is the, the way that I close the mapping, uh, the, the, the system, the mapping that closes the up, system. Up here. This is the impredicative part. Exactly. Of your yeah. your uh, relational diagram. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually a much simpler diagram in a sense than Rosen's diagram. Yeah, but it it's closed. Sense. But you can see all the efficient causes are made inside that. It's close to efficient causation. There's no problem with that. And I guess Rosen um, preferred the other diagram because it 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 is it's like uh, Occam's razor, right? It's it's sort of it has only one uh, material source, and and maybe based on those, it's always dangerous to apply simplicity arguments to biological systems. So now we have a slightly less elegant diagram here, but still very elegant, that actually maps to uh, uh, the biochemistry and the regulation of the cell. Um, what is nice about this is that we don't have, a, we have basically two functional levels. We have the level of F, which encompasses all of the catalysis in the cell. Right. And then we have, a, that's all the covalent catalysis in the cell. And then we have the level of G, which is all the Supramolecular chemistry of the cell, you know, right. the catalysis of that by intercellular milieu. It's actually very elegant, I think. It is. I didn't want to sort of say it's less elegant than Rosen. It is in a mathematical sense only, not from the biochemist's point. Yeah. Of well, even <laughs> I, I would even say that mine is mathematically less, more, more simpler. I don't need to, I mean, Rosen had to go into this contortion to, to show, you know, how it fits in. And it works, there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't need to do that. I mean, this is quite clear. I, I, will, I will concede this point because you will you, you get rid of the replicator mapping, which was yeah. basically the source of the whole problem with Rosen's 
um, diagram. But what is important to stress here probably is that it, it does save a lot of the, the arguments that uh, it, it, it does uh, uh, conserve the arguments that Rosen was making about closure to efficient causation, also the, about Rosenian complexity. All these arguments still apply 100% to this new diagram. Yeah. Yeah. Look, let's let's make it absolutely clear. I mean, Rosen, I think, was an absolute genius. Long before his time, nobody understood the language he was using, but the insights that he had were just incredible. I mean, yeah. I, I, I just you know, I stand in awe. Um, but it's just this particular thing that it didn't work, that didn't work so well. Yeah. 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 So I, I couldn't have done it without the formalism, without, you know, without Rosen's, you know, ground, groundbreaking work. For me, that was, you know, just, this is just a little ice, you know, cherry on the, cherry on the top of his um, huge work. I think this is a very good place. We need to keep an eye on the time as well. This is a good place to stop. And we had a little uh, discussion plan still about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gandhi's Camerton, but I think we can we can push that to the the. the we can. I think we can actually. But there's one more diagram. I think that is just just to close off the next one. Next one. Yeah. Yeah, because there was always this problem with the MR system. What is M and what is R and and what is B? What is you know what are the products of metabolism that then are you know used by the repair system, and Aloysius Louis also came to the same conclusion. In the end. The blue and the green, this is the intermediate metabolism and the fabrication part together. That's metabolism. It's not only intermediate metabolism, which many people have in mind, I think. So it's actually right. the two together. That's metabolism. The repair is actually the assembly part. So metabolism, I equate with fabrication and the repair, I equate with assembly. So and, this is a, an, an, a revisionist sort of interpretation that's very important yes. because usually people oversimplify and they say metabolism is just intermediary metabolism and R is often sort of superficially uh, equated to, to, to regulation um, uh, of, of enzyme levels and all that sort of thing. Well, often R is equated to protein synthesis. Or protein synthesis instead so of... Office, yeah. Holding. So often the, the, the split is made between the blue and so blue yeah. is metabolism and green is repair, but that's not right. that's not so. So that's important work. to to make a protein functional. You need the intracellular milieu to allow it to fold, and that is the repair mapping yes. in yes. your diagram. So that is yeah. no longer the same as most interpretations of traditionally of Rosen's diagram yeah. are postulating. Yeah. Okay. So let's stop here um, right. for today and uh, uh, revisit some of the points. What we're going to do now is that we have the ultimate model of the cell. Uh, we're going to see what kind of uh, more philosophical implications that has for, for several branches of biology, I would say, um, in, in the last and third part of, of our uh, discussions. I hope you'll also check that out. Uh, and we'll see you here again soon. Thank you, Yanni, so much. And uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Yogi. Really enjoyed that. Next, next time we throw out questions for other people to answer. Yes, it will be more informal and speculative.